everyone! Good evening and welcome to another episode of Pala Cuento. So Pala Cuento is a show by Pala where we discuss everything and anything landscape architecture, promoting the practice, services, and ideas related to the profession. So I'm Inessa Chahosa Dizer, your host for tonight's episode, and we have quite a few things to talk about tonight in line with creating open spaces here in the Philippines. So for tonight, uh, we'll be talking about placemaking in the Philippines, and I will be joined in by two of the most amazing women behind big movements in creating a better outdoor experience. So let's welcome in our guests for tonight, uh, landscape architect Faith Dumaligan and Miss Julia Nebriha. Hi. Good evening. <laughs> Hi, Good yes. evening. Hi, How are you guys? We're good. Doing well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. How's mm -hmm. how's the quarantine treating you? Um, I don't know with Julia, but here, Julia, it's like the third for this year, so um, kind of kind of difficult to move around again for for me. How about yeah? You, for Julia? sure, I was looking at you know how um your camera gives you a reminder of what you were doing this day last year or something, you yeah. know, and it was a picture of my daughter looking out of our apartment on the 20th floor of a apartment building across Metro Manila. We're stuck inside. And then today, mm -hmm. you know, she's, she's taking a walk outside in a park and it's, um, it's a very stark realization. I don't think people here where I live in Spain have any real understanding of what it's like to go through a quarantine and what coronavirus is really doing for many of communities in other parts of the world. Well, it's nice to know that you guys can just can already move around, no? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, since last year, it's been a completely different, it's, it's black and white, honestly. I, I cried the first morning that we arrived here, to be honest. We were walking outside <laughs> along a beautiful water esplanade in clean air and oh. wide spaces. And my daughter was like, for the first time, touching, you know, grass across a big park. And I, I honestly, I, I, I cried. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, for us here, we're we're back in square one. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm so sorry about that. But you know, no worries. But okay, so uh, before we dive into the topic, um, um, let's start by introducing you guys to our viewers for tonight. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you into, or what got you interested into, you know, master planning and the whole idea of place making. So we can start with um, Faith. Okay. Yeah, so um, like uh, I think most of the viewers here, I'm a landscape architect and also an environmental planner. And um, what got me into master planning, and I'll answer also placemaking since this is pala kwentuhan, pwede tayong mag extend at yeah. ng sagot. Um, <laughs> it started actually um, getting involved in uh, during first years, first two years of my um, stay in PJA, so I worked with PJA Creative Design for six years. So the first two years, um, the projects where I got involved are a lot on residential subdivisions. You know, you were handed with um, master plans from developers, and then you have to design this clubhouse area, make it um, interesting, the pool the um, amenities areas, you have indoor, outdoor, and then you have these small spaces at the corners, you know, between two lots, uh, maybe it's <laughs> an alley as prescribed by the PD957. And also like, um, it's a remnant from cutting those residential lots. So you'll have to, you, still have, you, have, you still have to design that uh, um, as, as an open space, right? I mean, at something where right. uh, some place where where the future residents will um, will uh, jog or see it, uh, and then you have the playgrounds if it's not uh, included in the clubhouse area. So it, you have those those projects, and then you will you you know that you can make it better, you know, in terms of uh, integrating these green spaces, make it more a network. Make it more accessible, uh, the patches, mm -hmm. you no, know, from from a central area or the clubhouse, you know, and so that led me into taking up masters in urban and regional planning. And then while I'm doing masters, I got thrown with projects like uh, more subdivisions, but now in this uh, in this case, they are more like 
uh, we're the ones who design who who will be designing. But the challenge are most of this um, lots, like 100 hectare or 70 hectare or 300 hectare, are like of slopes of more than 50 percent. So how will you create? Uh, how you how will you meet the you know 70 percent uh, uh, saleable lots while having those uh, terrain, right? So that's that um, that's a, that's the challenge that time. And so learning from SERP. Um, and also applying the concepts in landscape architecture, um, I, I, uh, that 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 helped me out through that uh, stage in my career. And then graduating from 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 SERP, so I got I got um, because when we say master planning, we we can say physical master plan, and we can have comprehensive master plan. No? So in SERP, the teaching is comprehensive master planning. So uh, what improved or what grew from my master, my special master plan uh, training is considering large sets of data from the sectoral part, uh, the sector sectors of the society, society like economic, social, institutional. So for example, before you you um, allocate a space for a hospital, you'll know the number of uh, population, yeah. the kids, etc., the schools, something like that. So dealing with large sets of data and translating that into special solutions. Um, and then hence the other projects that came by like comprehensive planning from that training. So for, um, for the placemaking, um, I remember when I was in high school, I joined the uh, we have we have programs in our school um, designing our front and backyard, so per classroom. So you'll have you'll you'll have to design it according to, like it speaks of your section or of, or of or of your class. So um, I was able to design to, for two years of of my high school um, joining joining that competition, and our uh, our class will uh, have won. Uh, two years of the four years of my high school that we joined that competition. And later on, um, in the last year of my high school, I joined this, um, they call this Chief Girl Scout Medal. It's a competition wow. by the Girl Scout of the Philippines uh, that um, uh, provides, uh, like there's, there are streams of competition. There's this social social aspect where you were were uh were a uh, uh, a participant or a part participant in this competition can do feeding programs and then there's this environmental stream that uh, a participant can do nursery three nursery programs something like that and then i selected the cultural promotion stream where mm -hmm. i pitched the um re redesign of our town landmark. So our town land, landmark is a white carabao because our town is known for rice. Um, it's called the rice granary of the Cordillera. And so I designed that, I pitched that to our mayor. And so he funded it. So this is like within six months lang na contest. Yeah. So dapat tapos na yung, yung construction and then People from the Girl Scout of the Philippines headquarters here in Manila will go and uh, will will inspect and judge um, the, the the outcome of the product, uh, the project. So within six months after pitching with the mayor, funding, and the and the engineering uh, department of our local government built it. Um, I got I I mean um, I got the medal. Uh, and later on, hindi ko siya napansin na part pa rin pala siya ng thesis ko nung, ma nung bachelor's degree. Wow. And of course, right now, <laughs> working as a landscape architect and environmental planner, um, it uh, it dawned to me na yun pala yung training ground ko. But uh, yeah, but, yeah <laughs> I'll, give it, I'll give the floor to Julia. <laughs> so, so it's much. more of organic, no? Organically like it led you to where you are now. How about Julia? 
Well, Faith and I come from different backgrounds, but we were both Girl Scouts. I just learned that for the first time <laughs> now, Faith. I didn't know that about you. Um, yeah, so I have a bit of a different story, but um, let's see where to start. Uh, I, went, I actually studied um, international relations and um, international development as my undergraduate. And I came to the Philippines initially on a Fulbright scholarship. And it was to study slum upgrading policies and programs. And during that time, I was working in Smoky Mountain in Tondo doing research. Mm -hmm. I lived there for two weeks um, and was doing household surveys and things like that. I ended up getting involved with the World Bank and getting a few projects on the ground there, especially also after Undoy. And so after that experience, I decided to, um, you know, it's my first time living in a living in a city like Metro Manila and you know, I, I could apply for the Fulbright in different places. Um, I decided yeah. to apply for the Philippines because I am half Filipino and it's someplace I had never lived before and I thought that might be interesting to discover more about it. Um, but mm -hmm. I really fell in love with Metro Manila as a city. It had a lot of the things that I liked about different places I've lived in my life. I grew up in New Orleans. I've lived in Saudi Arabia um, and I went to you know college in Washington, D.C. It had a very um, cosmopolitan feel to it, actually. And like it has a very interesting mix of like people and energy and, and history. And um, and I really just found a great sense of community in, 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 in my, you know, my life in Manila. And uh, I went to, um, I went to, actually, I ended up taking urban design because I was um, hanging out with Carlos Sildran and he had a magazine called Metropolis. And in that magazine, yeah. they were talking about urban design. And I had, I had known about like urban development and kind of, you know, the, the angle of the policy and, you know, sustainable cities and this mm -hmm. and that. Um, but I hadn't really known about the design profession really. So um, mm -hmm. I decided to apply, went to City College of New York and then came back to the Philippines afterwards um, and and just started to get involved in a lot of different projects. So I am a licensed environmental planner in the Philippines, but um, I don't really, I'm not really a designer. I work with a lot of designers. I'm definitely more, um, I have a policy background. I enjoy research mm -hmm. and those kind of things. But what I love the most, and I don't even know if this is a, I mean, I say that what I like is urban strategy um, because wow. what I enjoy is kind of like figuring out opportunities setting visions and kind of connecting the dots to figure out how to make it happen. So I kind of like these impossible yeah. challenges and um, Manila seems to be a great place <laughs> for <laughs> someone who likes uh, to take on really big challenges. It's a challenge. And, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that might seem like we don't really know how to get out of it or what the next mm -hmm. steps are. And if you're kind of also in a lot of ways, writing the playbook, for things that are that are new that that need to be done or maybe they've been done in other places but how do we do them in the philippines um i really had enjoyed that adventure over the last 11 years um the people who i met um the communities i was able to work with and just sort of uh that sense of urgency around urban design even if i'm not you know doing the master plan or, or doing the street design or um you know like faith like designing the park um, I've, I've always enjoyed and appreciated good design, and, and I try to put that at the center of whatever it is that we're trying to do. So at the end of the day, it's not just like, okay, well, we get to build a bike lane. Okay, well, what's that bike lane actually going to be? Because there's a difference between, you know, like this painted line and like this beautiful protected bike lane with a with a planting strip and, you know, the right access yeah. and um, yeah. you know, near an amazing park that leads to a plaza that connects to the city center that ends up, you know, being uh, this incredible network across uh, a city. So, so those things really excite me. And um, I, I just, I loved everyone that I met in that field in the Philippines. So it, it was a, you know, I'm, I'm kind of lonely <laughs> over here in my, in my advocacy and, and the fight, but you know, it continues and I'm, and I'm just really encouraged also to see everything that has been done since the onset of the pandemic. I think there's been an incredible advance in a lot of our advocacies and a lot of the profession, um, people understanding really um, the value of all of this in a way that that maybe you know wasn't as valued before. So um, so yeah, that's kind of um, where I where I come to this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to know that um, in a way we're um, at least you and my faith are have sort of similar backgrounds, but the approach is um, different. So we have one from design and one have having the background for policy making which really in the industry it's really working together and trying to create that better space for everyone right 
and we're so happy that we're challenged i guess <laughs> you know it's a good it's, my, it's a good thing because like you know i i think uh, i just came back from a bike conference in lisbon mm -hmm. and a lot of the you know eu countries that are represented there and you listen to the you listen to the presentations and you see the examples and what people are talking about and there's just a different sense of um there's just a different sense of urgency about it and i noticed that also you know for good or for bad when you you know a lot of their systems just work better on a lot of levels and so things somehow yeah. can actually um, they, like they expect that things are supposed to work a certain way. And so the thinking outside of the box sometimes isn't necessarily there because you're like, this is a process and this is the process how it's supposed to go. And um, this thing, this thing works. And, um, you know, our government's supposed to do that for us. Or I, I think that the level of innovation, I'm not surprised that actually, you know, when I share some things about the Philippines, they, they think that, you know, these are very innovative or like actually is quite fast paced. Or you know, um, they're, they're, they think that it's more interesting and exciting sometimes because uh, there's just something else that comes out of um, an environment where you have to, you know, think outside of the box to make things happen in a new way, and that you have to make so many new things happen at such a pace okay. that you know cities okay. grow in the Philippines. That um, mm -hmm. I think as more stories come out of the Philippines, I think we have a lot to add to the global conversation around urbanism. You know. Yeah. And so, well, at least the whole idea of placemaking, right? It's really the people, um, how these people will enjoy these spaces. And, you know, the ones that are actually going to use these spaces, like it depends um, based on country to country, right? So um, let's talk about um, at least parks now. Um, why do you think, like, why do you think the Philippines should, or at least should, have more parks um, with what we already have, or what are the importance of have, having these network of open spaces? Like, um, if there's anything you want to say about that, uh, we can start with um, okay. Yeah, I'll answer first. What's the importance, right? And I'm sure Julia will add yeah. on this because she's um, she's uh, working on. I'm sure her or her her expertise is urban strategy, and she's she uh, yeah. she has done some uh, programs on that, right? So I'll start mm -hmm. from the importance, and of course, um, as landscape architects, know the importance of um, open spaces, um, especially a network right. of open spaces. So network because um, uh, if we're thinking about ecosystem, right? Um, the 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 uh, ecosystems are arranged at least partially by patches in networks con interconnected right so yeah. um so for our ecosystem to to um uh deliver their functions like air pollution abatement uh uh drainage right um flood control we need to have this network of open spaces not just network, um, it's also um, various types. So if we, if we get into the urban setting, we need to um, emphasize various types because um, the, the environment changes in an urban setting. You have paved areas, right, et cetera. So uh, various, like um, there are, if we follow the LA law thinking, you have open space types uh, promote, uh, prioritizing human recreation. So you have the parks, plazas, esplanades, mm -hmm. and streetscapes. And then you have uh, the types that prioritize ecosystem service or limit human recreation or, um, or, uh, or built structures, right? Forest reserves, mangroves, etc. So why does the Philippines um, don't have enough open space? Um, of course, uh, um, first, it's easy to say that we have we don't have an umbrella policy, but we have existing policies. No, so what what do we have yeah. right now? We have those you know, nine five seven subdivision law yeah. that requires it in um, mixed use developments, residential de subdivision developments. We have BP two two zero for uh, the social ho housing um, awesome. developments. We have guidelines from uh, the uh, now Department of uh, Urban Development and Human Settlement, DSU, uh, that uh, uh, specify like 500 square meter per 1,000 population, 
etc cetera, etc cetera. there are other guidelines on going uh, uh, being being um, being drafted right now uh, regarding open spaces to accommodate uh, climate resilience and disaster res resilience mm -hmm. then we have laws and department guidelines uh, prescribing easements uh, spaces that should remain unbuilt and unpaved surface areas as um, defined by the building code so we have those and then we have also environmental laws uh, like uh, NIPAS, Climate Change Act, Disaster Resilience, Philippine Disaster Resilience Act. So basically we have those uh, and so the next problem is that um, we have various translation of those those lo laws right yeah. so yeah. um so with 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 that with those various translations we we implement it differently so that's why we have um ports uh, uh that needs landfill destroys a white beach stretch for example in bantayan you know yeah. but if you look at the water code uh the water code prescribes that there's no permanent structure or at least yeah. structure only for salvage uh, purposes, you know. So yeah. it's more of the translation of those laws and uh, that missing point or that missing area before implementation should be a role as designers, planners, or urban yeah. designers, you know. Uh, and, and, and not just designers, uh, you've mentioned al already a while ago that it should be a collaborative effort. We need influencers um, yeah. that will promote the importance of open space. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of influencers right now. You have those greenwashing pro products already um, all around the, in the uh, virtual world. And then we, ha we need also multi-generational set of leaders that will um, that will uh, propose policies uh, that will influence other the politicians or the leaders that we have in the government to um, really uh, maybe write that policy that we are waiting for maybe through the land, National Land Use Act. Um, and I think Julia can talk about this policy um, strategies more and better. Sure, I mean, so what's the what's the acronym now? How do you say it? The the D what is it? DHUD? What is it? How D do you say it? DSUD. DSUD. Oh, okay. Yeah. I haven't I haven't I haven't heard it pronounced yet. Okay, so DSUD. All right. Anyways, um so I would say just like taking a step back, uh, you know, what what is not important about it? I mean, like we always ask like what's important about public space mm -hmm. and parks and all these things, like what's not important about it? I mean, it's literally important for That's everything. Um, exactly. You know, it's important for mobility. You can't move in a city without good streets. Um, nothing mm -hmm. will work without that. Um, it's important for equality. It's important so that everyone has access to the city and that everyone, even if you don't have money to go into a mall, you have a park that you can go to to relax in. It's important for climate exactly. resilience. Um, it's important mm -hmm. for biodiversity. It's important for a sense of character and being able to communicate the spirit and creativity of a place that's you know different from New York is different from Paris, is different from Tokyo, is different from Manila, because people put their creative spirit into what it looks like, you know, for good or for bad, right? But, um, yeah. you know, some things better, some things worse, but um, they're distinct, right? And so, so all of that matters when it comes to what is the social fabric, what is the energy of a city? Um, public space is the, is the place that you experience that, because, like, I'm not going to go to Manila and go to your house. Right, like I'm gonna go to Lynetta Park, or I'm gonna go, you know, maybe to Pasig River or something like that. Um, so, you know, I think um, it's it's incredibly important on on so many levels, um, and especially in delivering a city that's 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 fair and a delivery a city that works for for everyone and and for the environment. Um, you know, how you get there is another story. Um, like what Faith is talking about, there's a million laws that that exist. Um, yeah. You know, I think um, I think placemaking is a really interesting avenue because placemaking is not just about the thing that you build, but it's the process by which you build it. And I think that that's a really interesting way to start to get more people involved, learning the process of how things get changed in cities. And I think that's one of the really important, um, you know, impacts of placemaking because you get people involved. 
Um, you help, you know, you don't, we don't keep the knowledge just in this like ivory tower, you know, we, we, we work together and we figure out how to write an ordinance or you figure out how to talk to the local barangay to remove the parking on the street so that you can have a street festival. Um, you figure out what it, permission you need to get from the city hall to put in a local landmark or um, you start to find the funding to get faith's next generation of the um, high school backyard. I, I think that's great, whatever, you know, however that happens. And, and, and then you work together with people to figure out how to agree on what will be done, how, how money will be spent, how things will be implemented, which day you're going to launch it, what the color is going to be. I mean, this is how cities are made. Cities are made by all of us. You know, it's not yeah. just made by, I mean, sometimes it is just made by one person in a room, <laughs> unfortunately, but, <laughs> but technically everyone has the right to participate in that process. A lot of us just don't know how, how, you know, and it's a skill like anything else, you know, how to be part of your city takes a lot of work, takes a lot of know-how, not impossible, yeah. you know, but it, I mean, I think especially with placemaking, you learn how to do it with other people and you learn about that community building. And that's really what starts to create change on a, on a much wider scale. And, um, and so I think, you know, some of it is to be worked on, you know, at that level of the national bills and things like that. And some of it is to be done by figuring out how to get a tree planted on your street. Yeah. All of it counts. That's true. Yeah. To give light to our viewers, um, and at least in the experience of the work that you've done, how did the people get in, or at least the different projects, how do people get in, involved in in these? Sure. Um, I'll just, so in, in one example, so I've worked um, in Escolta, for instance, um, <laughs> as someone who was uh, renting space there and participated in some of the organization of events there and some of the advocacy. And um, there were just so many groups involved, um, whether it's from a heritage angle or if it was from um, like an environmental angle around the river um, or a neighborhood building. So there was just so many different uh different types of communities who were interested and found a home in Escolta. And, and so I think a lot of people started out by kind of like finding um, people that cared about the same things and, and came together in that way. And then some people took uh, leadership in organizing um, like the, the block parties or organizing some of the tours or organizing uh, different events that became this this bigger movement over over a period of time. So um, I, I find that in the Philippines, there's just so many. I mean, even when I started biking, like I joined a fixed bike group, fixed gear, and we would I would meet them at um, a bike repair shop, and we would bike like four hours <laughs> at night around. Wow. Um, and that's how I got to learn how to to bike in the city because I hadn't really ever. I mean, I. I lived in New York, I lived in DC and I had a bike, but I didn't bike as like my primary form of transportation. Yeah. Um, and then I was living in Malate and that's, this is before Uber and all of that. So it was like, you had to, had to either go on a Jeep, a tricycle, LRT, uh, MRT, or, you know, you could try your chances getting a taxi home <laughs> late at night and yeah. you didn't know what that was going to be like. And so it just felt like the easiest way to get from A to B would be a bicycle. Um, mm -hmm. So I joined that group, which led me joining to other groups and getting involved eventually in this whole mobility track that has led me to <laughs> so many different things, honestly, until today. Um, and and so I think, you know, finding co uh, commonalities with people who share similar interests around certain issues and then within that also figuring out like what you bring to the table. So I think a lot of designers end up, you know, adding in like renderings that um, contribute to like visualizing what something can be like, you know, even if it's never yeah. built, I see a lot of that happening. Um, people writing about their opinions. Um, there's a lot of different ways. And then of course, um, there's a big movement of how to just get involved in your barangay and being part of your community meetings. Um, now I think most of it's online, but before there's, you know, people who have taken the step to petition for ordinances and, and be like very directly yeah. active in, in that sense. And we, we saw that a little bit um, when we were working in uh, the Green, Green, Green project in Department of Budget and Management, where we would see some citizens like asking us, like, how do we how do we ask our city to do this? Well, like you have to call the mayor's office and you have to request it, or you got to call your council member or your, you know, your, your barn guy or whoever, and, and yeah. try to get it up the, the chain um, to be, mm -hmm. to be seen and decided upon by your city. Uh, so I think there's a lot to learn 
within how that how that works, but there's a lot of different entry points. Correct, correct. Nice. I, I myself have the experience trying to get involved <laughs> with, 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 with my local community at least. I mean, I think there's, I mean, the Philippines is so rich for that. I think there's like a, there's sort of like the barcada culture, there's the batch culture, there's kind of yeah. these things that um, you can always find a sense of belonging. <laughs> I've, I've felt mm -hmm. at least in my experience um, yeah. in, you know, the, the problem is like just not to be part of like so many. Um, whereas, you know, where I am now in Spain, I, I went to the, the meeting of this local mobility group and it's like just a few people there, you know, and they meet sometimes and um, yeah. it's interesting. It's, I mean, I, I found that the Philippines is very rich in that, in that sense. That's nice. That's nice. Yeah, we do have that culture, I guess. Like, um, I guess the whole um, family orientedness, being mm -hmm. part of something, is even seen in like different aspects, you know. So, um, well, the work that um, you both do are really, really like great in contributing, you know, to at least the the whole place making here in the country would you be able to share um, at least the most memorable experience you've had when when you were here and when you were here in the Philippines and from Faith, at least with the work you do now, if you could share a few most memorable experiences that you had. I'll go first. Who do yours? Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right. Um, of course, uh, what will make it more memorable will uh, be a pione pioneering project our program. So like um, Julia has already mentioned a while ago, uh, we work we, we work on the Green 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 program. So it's green, the green, yeah. it's a funding uh, program by the uh, Department of Budget and Management. And um, uh, we were able to work with 150 cities, Julia? <laughs> I think 45, yeah. 145, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right, so um, I was part uh, of the first year uh, of that program, mm -hmm. so it's the pioneering year, and uh, able to um, uh, well, the job is the technical assistance, technical review of the um, public open space projects of the cities, Philippine cities, and so it uh, went to really um, like teaching them how to design uh, and more. <laughs> And, and and like um, what Julia did, uh, programs like uh, training, uh, walk through, uh, walk through sessions in uh, public open space projects, um, et cetera, and et cetera. But uh, that's memorable for me, uh, a pioneering project. And also one pioneering yeah. project I'm with right now is the um, building climate uh, resilience through urban planning and design by the UN Habitat. So um, it's uh, climate resilience urban design project. So we're also working with uh, a lot of open spaces like uh, rivers, esp river esplanades, parks, streetscapes, etc. And with the pilot projects that we have worked on, it will help uh, draft the guidelines uh, that will also be disseminated to uh, other Philippine cities. So one of, so the pr pilot project that I work on um, got uh, international review, hoping, uh, hopefully it will get funded. So it passed the first, um, what do you call that? Like first screening for the funding. Mm -hmm. So also that's um, one that meets my, ex uh, one memorable experience uh, in, in the work that I do, the, the, uh, one that gets uh, international um, uh, attention of the international yeah. audience. And I remember working with PGAE also. Uh, 2013, we helped uh, the mayor then to mm -hmm. uh, for, for her presentation for the final, I think it's the, the final de deliberation for the most livable cities award uh, for a, for a, for the category of a city of more than 250,000 population, something like that. And it's memorable because not because not just because it got uh, the attention of the international re reviewing body, but um, if you will look into look into the finalists, there's one in Italy, there's one in Thailand, I Taiwan, 
and I look into their open spaces because we prepared the section of representation where uh, uh, with the projects that we work on with Pasig City, the open space projects. So of course they have the you know the urban the, the open spaces that a designer would would want to have. Yeah. And so like okay, well, would I work for this? Will it still get the attention? So uh, basically they won the silver medal uh, for the for, for for that year. Nice. I wonder. So, I, will, oh. I hope. We, we, we see this not at least being funded and implemented soon. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> That's one thing. <laughs> How about Wait, you, I was, Julia? I was remembering, you know, I think my moment would have been when we had that event, the launch event at the National right, right. Museum. And we were um, inaugurating or awarding the first 66 cities that were going to get the fund released. And we had there, you know, all of the mayors from the different cities um, we had actually a video to launch the project that we had written ourselves and got, you know, made <laughs> the promo video. We had descriptions of the 66 projects that I couldn't even the read branding. fast enough. Yeah, the branding. We had, you know, we branded <laughs> this project so it could really be something and, and look really legit. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, having all the people there, having the cities be excited having you know people hear about for the first time what all these projects were going to be it wasn't just you know um this green patch of grass it was a mangrove park with a boardwalk it was going to be um you know a celebration of the cherry blossoms in this in this kind of uh design in puerto princesa it was going to be gora lane in qc which was this network of pedestrian access points linking transportation uh hubs which was recently I heard um, the mayor uh, Belmonte used it in a presentation about like livable livable Quezon City, and you know we nice. had gone through at Faith and Dawn um, and uh, and and Winona and Winona yeah. like we had gone through so much they went through so much we went through so much together to just we had no idea going into this we're like oh it's it's money and we'll just work with 145 cities <laughs> and they'll send us proposals <laughs> and we'll review them and we'll just do it and it was just it was so incredible um the pace of it all the amount of work and to to get to that point and have the secretary of the budget of management be recognizing this have senators like senator angara senator lagarda there awarding the cities handing out seedlings being in the um the history the museum of natural history with jeremy barnes in it where, where the exhibit was about philippine biodiversity and it was like all of those things that you'd want to come together like honestly i felt like i was more excited about than my wedding you know my husband won't watch this so like <laughs> I, I i mean when you're it's that kind of thing where you like want everything to go well you want all the pieces to come together yeah. and you want it to like equal something bigger than what it is and symbolize something yeah. really important. You know, like I felt like that was a really special moment. Paulo Alcazarin was there. I mean, there was just, it, it felt like a really important moment in that shift of, you know, maybe not now, but maybe in like some years in the future, I hope that yeah. um, people will see that this was uh, the starting point of when there started, when there was more public space and more attention on public space and commitment at the national government level for that in a way that um, a lot of other, you know, I, I was on a panel for something and um, the, the speaker was saying, you know, she would love to see that a lot of these individual placemaking movements make uh, impact um, with federal commitment. And this was the United States example. And I was actually yeah. thinking like, well, we, we actually did that, right? Like that was a national, that was a government level commitment to yeah. public space that a lot of other countries haven't had that. And um, so that was quite a, a career highlight for me. I mean, across my career, I would say that that was a, a major highlight for me and just what it celebrated overall for, for the movement. Definitely nice. for me too, Julia. So yeah, it was good. It was, nice. <laughs> it was worth it. It was worth all of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't know what you guys went through, but hearing um, the stories, at least of what, um, you know, seeing the work that you do be recognized or at least have that recognition and just on and on with different projects, um, comparing it to international um, um, projects. I mean, in a way, I, I'm so proud. <laughs> I am proud of at least the work that you do. and. Um, it's nice to know that we're not behind 
at least the Philippines isn't behind in terms of you know these things. Um, we have a question from sorry, Brian. I, sorry, I just have to add one other thing yeah. about that. The Philippines. But, I was talking to a woman from Germany. And she was talking, because I was saying, you know, we have to engage the youth. And she was saying, you know, mm -hmm. because we have, we're not repopulating, um, you know, the youth voice is actually not as strong. Um, you know, the Philippines is an extremely young country. The fact yeah. that even, I mean, well, I'm not technically youth anymore by the UN standards, but you guys are still youth. <laughs> but the youth I'm not. This conversation, Inez like, will be. You know, you, Inez, like, Maybe Inez, I'm not too. <laughs> I don't know. After 35, not to date us, but... Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, I think that that's something that's a huge advantage also, like you've got, mm -hmm. you know, um, extreme participation on social media. Um, you've got a huge, yeah. we've got a huge youth, youth, um, a next generation is very youthful, talented, educated, uh, knowledgeable generation that can change mm -hmm. this entire thing. And that's going to be a superpower as well. Just wanted to add that. Yeah. Sorry. There's a question. Yeah. I didn't see the, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, especially now that, um, we're in lockdown everything's through social media and the power of social media can really you know bring so much change um yeah so we have a question from byron he said hi um could be either for faith or julia understanding that place making is very important and in the society we, li we live in in some cases clients wanted evidence-based dollar peso value out of the place or open space so in your experience, is there a way or at least a tool that we can use to quantify the value of a space so that we can at least convince stakeholders that providing these will benefit the people and profit the clients? It's a long question, but um, but that's true. Um, is there any tool being used now so that you know these um, um, proposals or these certain things are um, could be you know understood in a peso peso language or yeah anyone can answer do you want to do you want to start julia um i don't have any i mean there, there are a number of them um so mm -hmm. i'll just mention that like for some for some cities it's important to show the impact on health so like the amount mm -hmm. that you will save on for instance having people who exercise who go outside and bike and walk and are able to live healthy lives there's there's yeah. that benefit because you know especially you're talking about health costs in the future that you're going to have to pay mm -hmm. as a society um also like with air pollution uh there are um you know there are economic numbers to be said for uh, the health costs of, um, you know, and the economic impact also of having a society that's not healthy, that dies early from these kinds of diseases um, and health uh, complications. There are, there are numbers yeah. for that. Um, there are also numbers for, to support the real estate value increases. Um, and there's also numbers to support that people want to live in livable neighborhoods, which include, of course, having like accessible, walkable um, designed mm -hmm. kind of master plan. So I think that there's yeah. there's a lot of numbers from the envi from the environmental side, uh, the health side, and also from the the real estate side. Um, Faith, I'm, maybe you have more to add. I'm, I'm trying to. Th there, there's got to be more. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I think other, if right? I'm not if yeah. I'm not mistaken, I think ULI has a tool. ULI has a tool. Yeah, that's right. Urban, ULI has Urban a tool. Land Institute. Mm -hmm. That the healthy have, healthy communities toolkit. Um, they also have a public space. Um, yeah toolkit where you can yeah maybe like i'll that, just yeah. add um mm -hmm. it depends mm -hmm. on because if we say um people planet profit it's still large areas no large sectors to really intersect yeah. these three um components no uh and and actually i i tried to pitch my master's thesis to mm -hmm. like uh, a tool for open space uh, to con to compute the um, economic uh, value uh, for ecosystem services. So, how much do you save when yeah. this open space, uh, in terms of air pollution abatement, uh, carbon sink, etc. So, I pitched yeah. that it's very um, it's very ha <laughs> difficult to <laughs> to do. Yeah. So, I yeah. got rejected. So, I um. I went into um, computing the value in terms of carbon sequestration. Sequestration. Yeah, but it's not yeah. it it's not quantifying the the savings in peso, but really quantifying how much carbon uh, is uh, stored in the urban open space, yeah. and um, a lot of research are 
more on three storage uh, of of carbon. Uh, but yeah. if you'll concede, if if the if the world will be if seventy percent of the world will be or will be uh, uh, urbanized you know, in by twenty fifty, then our our hope for for nature to live to thrive are the ur urban open spaces, right? Yeah. So that's the um, hypothesis of my thesis. So it should be designed to really um, capture carbon. Yeah. But I think I mean, Actually, it this, also, yeah. I would say like who your audience is. So like different people right. care about different things. So if it's like a master planner, Correct. then they're going to maybe it's ev showing evidence also from other case studies to say that, you know, people are moving to these developments over these ones because they have more open space. They have better streets. You know, they have better access. Um, the, the, the livability of them is just is higher and people are willing to pay more to live in these places or at least there's more demand. And then I think if you're talking to like a mayor, um, you know, if you use a case like Ilo Ilo, you talk about the Ilo Ilo Esplanade and talk about that the land values near that near that Esplanade increased. I can't remember what Paula yeah. said. It's like something crazy, right? I mean, more than more than doubled at least, right? Yeah. Um, the land yeah. values, which comes back to the city in, in realized increased property tax. So I, I would say, um, even if you don't find like a, a, a one calculator that works for all of it, um, yeah. I think finding the right case studies based on the arguments that work best with who you're trying to convince um, will, be, will be the way to find the right kind of um, information. Actually, this question is so interesting because I don't know if um, you know that um, Ma'am Faith was actually my professor. And when I was doing my thesis, I actually, um, um, I talked to you about this, Ma'am Faith, right? My, my thesis was really about valuing the open, the open space, or at least the spark in yeah. Manila, and how to, con how to be able to come up with a tool to convince um, the mayor or at least the, the, the local government there on how to keep that space. And it's interesting because I, I used her I used her thesis, her master thesis as a basis for my thesis when I was doing my undergraduate. And it's true, it's difficult. It's not easy yeah. <laughs> to, uh, to evaluate these open spaces and it takes a lot of time and also um, a lot of resources to really be able to evaluate different um, not just carbon sequ sequestration, but even um, recreational value yeah. and all but those. I think it's that's a, where also, yeah. sorry, and that's also where placemaking comes in. Because there's mm -hmm. like, when you design the thing and then you go to build it. And then I remember like also in, um, in Green, 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 we had this question because it's like, okay, you're going to inaugurate the park. The trees aren't grown yet. Like you have the rendering, right? And then you've mm -hmm. got like this yeah. kind of like green space with maybe some seedlings and it doesn't look like the beautiful rendering yet. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, is it anticlimactic? And then the mayor's, you know, gonna say, oh, well in four years, I'm not gonna, I mean, not even in four years, but when you start to talk about the health benefits of the taxes that we're gonna save in the future or like the carbon sequestration that's gonna be there in like 20 years yeah. or whatever, like I'm not even gonna be voted in again. And so, you know, I think the place making value in convincing people Mm -hmm. people that live there who might you know you might have taken away their parking you might have inconvenienced them in some way to like make way for this public space and also for the politics of it which is that you know you want to show that you're doing something impactful mm -hmm. today for the people who need it you need to activate the space so as much as you think about what you're going to design and of course how people are going to use it and this is something that Janet City Khan talked about what they did in New York is that they didn't just like close the streets and then say oh well we did it they also like planned activities made sure groups were going to participate and be there and like be biking in the area or be you know like using the space and show yeah. already day 1 that it's successful so you have to also think about the programming. And it's something that I loved learning a lot about doing like the car free days and um, that I did in, in Intramuros through Viva Manila with Carlos Soldran and his group. Mm -hmm. And also um, in Escolta with the different communities in Escolta was learning about like activating space and how much that can be um, that real live example for what could be a different future. Now you have to almost mm -hmm. stage it like a play. Like you have to, you have to live out what you want the new reality to be. And and place making and sort of that tactical urbanism and that pop up culture has a really big role 
in uh, and being able to help people see that and convince with yeah. you know without if you don't have all the data or you don't have your arguments aren't landing about like certain things that we might all care about like health and the environment and you know um social yeah. justice and things like that that are, yeah. sometimes can be intangible to some people Correct. if you can see the difference and the benefits of it um clearly i i think that that can be very powerful as well that's true that, that's true because um it's one thing with um telling them what it can be and it's another with just leaving it out there and really not being able to use this space at all afterwards right <laughs> So, um, yeah. yeah, so in your experience in GGG, there's a question. Um, they're asking if the metrics of, of this is recognized by um, the national, by NEDA, or is it, um, are they being used in the Philippine government to justify funding open spaces outside uh, GGG? I don't, I, unfortunately, I'm not really sure if, if it has made it that far. Um, I know that there are some groups trying to push for uh, some of the data to be collected around that. Um, during our time, we did require that data be submitted along with the application. So in theory, uh, you would be able to understand how much uh, open space has been added over the course of this funding, see the list of projects, understand the diversity, understand some of the impacts, and, and hopefully that could be a basis for justifying future investments. Um, so in theory, in theory, yes. Uh, in practice, I, I don't know if anyone is 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 has taken that up. <laughs> okay. So um, okay, let's let's get to know you a little bit more outside the work that you do, <laughs> um, outside this whole um, place. Maybe. But um, what are what are some things that um you guys enjoy doing at your own like outside outside work? I'll start right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, if it's not pandemic, I love traveling uh, for oh, adventure, yeah. be sure, and connecting yeah, yeah, yeah. connecting with my family also because they're uh, not here in the Philippines. Connecting also with friends in other parts um, of the world, uh, and I'm grateful for um, the field we are in that takes me to, to those places as well. At some sometimes. You know. Um, but right now, the pandemic, um, so we cannot move. Actually, with this <laughs> third lockdown, if if we yeah. didn't have this third lockdown, I should be in Batanes, etc., Atimon, and for I mean for work and for quarantine also, because mm -hmm. <laughs> you get quarantined diba, right now when you go to um, other places for, outside Metro yeah. Manila. Um, I also love teaching. So I'm actually yeah. uh, volunteering right now in our church. Uh, we're taking up a class from a school here, a college here in Quezon City, World City Colleges, uh, we're helping out the teachers. So uh, to, 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 like we're taking um, some of the sessions in a month so she can be relaxed. They can be relaxed mm -hmm. for, you know, some point. And we, we, we also uh, uh, do like online retreat to the teachers so other teachers public school teachers so i like that and i like music mm. mm -hmm. what kind yeah. of music i like i like playing guitar and singing <laughs> sample sample <laughs> mm. okay i'll give it to juliana <laughs> <laughs> you juliana <laughs> so um i i guess in manila um you know, I, I don't know. I think like the advocacy is a way of life and like most of mm -hmm. my passions, it's just a matter of like, what are you getting paid for and what are you just doing on your own time? I don't know. Like I really, um, you know, a lot of the stuff outside of like work, work is like still related to, to these issues and the things that I was really passionate about. Um, so most of the time I was biking, um, I liked, I liked writing. I still write a bit, you know, um, writing articles, writing for the newspaper, things like that. Um, I had a column at one point called Wonder Woman, if you can believe that, because <laughs> I would just go around the city and then write about it. Mm -hmm. Um, and who gave me the title? It was either Paolo or Appa Ong Ping. I can't remember now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, talking with friends, you know, like, oh, we should do this project. Oh, I saw this space. Why don't we do something there? And like, 
you know, one of them was um, a good friend of mine is, is Leroy New, and we've partnered on a lot of things together. And we had this idea of floating something down the Pasig River that he would build and someone would perform inside of it. And we ended up applying for a Burning Man grant. And we got it. Uh -huh. And we did this project. And that was actually how I learned about the governance around Pasig River, because I had to go to like yeah. 10 different agencies to get permission to float this thing down the river. And mm -hmm. it ended up being the basis of the knowledge that I used later at DBM when we wanted to do the ferry, Pasig River Ferry Convergence Program, because I actually knew who to go to for all of those things because of that art project, you know? So yeah. um, right. a lot of the things for me would bleed into like, um, I lived in Poblacion for a while, and one of my friends, Daniel, ran this thing called the the Jam, um, where the different artists would come together and just kind of have an open mic, and we would go and yeah. hang out. And we, you know, they would do them indoors, but sometimes they would also do them in some of the parks around Makati. And I just loved that to see people mm. outside enjoying being together in a public space, sharing their art. That was always for me. Um, something I, I really enjoyed spending my time doing um, that I guess you could yeah. say was outside of work, but was like, sometimes it felt like you did other things <laughs> so that you can afford to do these things that you don't get paid yeah. for, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, now that I'm here and now that it's been pandemic and now that I have children, um, that has a lot of that has changed. Um, I am learning how to cook. Um, the Philippines has a lot of incredible food, as you all know, and you can order it from your phone or you can walk outside and get it from someone on the street. And here I cannot. <laughs> um, I found a store called uh, the Coruña, Coruña Asia Mart. And who runs it but Julian, a Filipino. And wow. so I go there like once a week and uh, buy ingredients. And so I'm learning how to make things that I've never made before. Filipino dishes, Korean dishes, Vietnamese dishes, Taiwanese dishes, uh, you know, Thai food. Because I just can't, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can't get good ones here. So I'm learning how to cook. Um, some people say that it's like so relaxing and they love it. I, I personally yeah. have not found that yet. But um, <laughs> I like listening to podcasts. Um, so maybe someone's listening to this podcast while they cook. Um, so mm -hmm. that's kind of, and of course, you know, just going out for, for walks with no, um, with no agenda. I've always loved that about cities, you know, just go out, maybe think of a place you want to go to in your mind and just wander. Like that has oh. been something that um, with no agenda and just see what catches your eye and which way you want to go. Um, cause so much when you're going through a city, you're used to like your normal routine, like how you go somewhere. And so you kind of just do the same yeah. thing. So I always, if I have time, I like to just like take a different street Wander and, around. See, and see what I find. You know, I, I find yeah. that like, it's like a little mini vacation, a little mini adventure when you can't get it, uh, <laughs> elsewhere. I miss the, uh, bacon there in, in, in Spain. Really, oh, I remember you, you, you gave us some. Yes, yeah, the jamon, the jamon. Jamon, right, right. Jamon. Yeah. Oh, gosh, oh, so there's so much jamon good. here. <laughs> oh, so yeah. Oh, did you set it up? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, it's good, but I'll tell you what. I mean, there's not really, like, I miss, like, God, I miss, like, Sinigang or something like that. Yeah. Like, they're just the food. Have you tried making? Styles. Have you tried I making have tried. It's been so unsuccessful. That's the one that I would say is the least successful so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so some say it's this. easy it's easy to make you just um put everything in one pot and leave it till dinner <laughs> you would think you would yeah. think but without the same vegetables you know yeah. and the same uh sour kind of it's not the although julian said he's going to get uh, a new shipment of the packets you know like the sinigang the, ah, <laughs> the sinigang, the sinigang, yeah, sinigang uh, mamacita. what's it called the mama yeah yeah, the mama um, nor, mama yeah. Oh, nor. So maybe I'll have success after I get out. Well, you should use the tamarind sometimes. That, that helps with the... Yeah, but where am I going to buy it? Oh, that's true. You know, things like that, like lemongrass. Where are you going to get lemongrass? Or mm -hmm. like, where are you going to get... I mean, there's just certain things that just taste, you know... You're Filipina, uh, Julia. You're really Filipina. Well, yeah. I didn't realize how. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still, so you're like craving, food. like, yeah, I, I would do anything for like a, a bungus breakfast from Max's. Oh. Like, I would, like, with all the <laughs> achara and everything, like, I can't tell you. <laughs> 
Yeah, top well, of the oh, I could go on. I could go on. Don't let me take up the whole podcast on Filipino food. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a lot of Filipino food that also um um came from sp- yeah. Spain, no? Like uh, influenced uh, by Spanish food. There are I think there adobo. Are. Yeah, but you can't things are so they say things here like if it's if it's adobong style, but it just means that it's like sauce or like asado, meaning yeah, like it's just yeah. like marinated or something, but it's not like the the flavor profiles of the vinegar and stuff are mm. not the same. So I've got so I got patis uh at that from Julian. <laughs> I got you know, and like I'm really like messaging him, like trading, like, are you gonna get the patis? <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> so is it coming and I'm like waiting outside his store for him to open. Um but yeah, slowly slowly I'm getting I'm getting better on it at it. Nice. <laughs> a yeah. taste of home. But you'll 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 get there. Just a little bit more practice probably. Yeah, I just I think you know the being domestic was not something that was very much my expertise um, before like getting married, having two kids and now also like living here without Yaya and such. And so it's a big, it's a big learning curve. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, well, it's good to know that um, you guys are still finding other, other hobbies besides, you know, regular, like when pre or pre pandemic, it was work like, work 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 but it's nice to be able to have a little time i guess um outside of that um routine you know so um there's a follow-up question sorry um i'm just gonna ask this um what existing policy policy sorry can we review or improve that can help us enable green and public open spaces yeah faith i i mean i guess you and i should just like put together our different Google Docs and maybe make something yeah. that everyone can access. Because I feel like between <laughs> us, we have, like, I have some of this information <laughs> in a yeah. Google Doc. Um, I don't really know that there's, like, one place. Has anyone, I don't know, has anyone published, like, one place where you can find all of that? Um, well, I know Dazzle, the one who <laughs> asked this question. I think it's <laughs> my classmate in Masters. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think I mentioned a lot a while ago. Uh, in the second question. Well, there's also so Dinky's, the book that Dinky did, the Parks and Public Open Spaces yeah. Design the Guide. The development guide, right. yeah. That has yeah. a lot of, that has some of them in there too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Is also in SERP, uh, there's a subject in SERP, uh, Land Use Planning. And I'm not sure if it's, uh, I, I forgot the course code. Um, so there are uh, presentations there that list a lot of laws uh, or related laws on open spaces. Yeah. So um, there are documents already. Uh, uh, Julia mentioned one a while ago, public, public yeah. uh, PPOS, public parks and open spaces. Just looking at the like that. Published online. by, um, what's yeah. the group, uh, Julia? Um, it's Dinky's Consultancy Group. I don't remember what the acronym For, is. Where's my I, I forgot the name. Oh, yeah, no but public, uh, public, public parks and open spaces, they can search that. Okay. So yeah, there's a compendium, our... compendium of, uh, yeah, Assure by Assure. Assure, there you go. Yeah, here it is. I, I mean, I, I sent the link um, in this chat group. Maybe Paula can share it. Parks, okay. public parks open green, public public parks open and green spaces, a planning and development guide. guide so guide I participated in this, um, in the review of this. There's case studies. There's um, some policies are there. I think there might be more that Faith mentioned um, that are, th- these are like the main yeah. ones, but there's there's just so many different, um, you know, things that can be cited. And, and I, we, you know, we shouldn't forget, I know it's a weak, not a weak argument, but it's, you know, of course the Philippines is signatory to the, the SDGs, um, to to other of these like international agreements that, that do say that, you know, we should be building livable cities, which, Public space is a is a main yeah. is a main focus of that. <laughs> yeah, so that's correct. That's public parks open and green spaces. Yeah. I think Paula is also part yeah. of this. Yeah, Paula. Is yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll Nappy try to share. And Sir yeah, we'll try to share. The PDF this. is online now, so yeah. um, that's a good that's a good yeah, public starting artists. point. Correct. Yeah. All right. There. If um okay, there correct published by Usher correct. Um, if 
you can give three most valuable tips or insights, at least to those who wish to pursue working in urban development um, and with the government or the civil society, what would they be? Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Of course, working with uh, urban development projects and with the government or civil society is very different from working with this private sector. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so uh, I, I, I just uh, smiled a while ago because this was asked to me by um, an ARC 162 class that I guess teach uh, a few months ago. So um, first is, you know, uh, Julia is a founder of Agile, City, Agile partners. Cities, City Partners. So Agile thinking is one. And we've learned that a lot in working with Green Green Green, with the Green 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 program. So um, of course, uh, our work turned out to be more than we expected, right? We had to teach the cities, et cetera, et cetera. So we yeah. need to... Uh, we, we came to a point that we need to propose the project. Like Julia already mentioned that uh, city a while ago, a project a while ago, the Coraline, the one in Puerto Princesa city, because they were proposing projects outside the basic uh, guidelines that um, the department has already set for the funding or what type of yeah. project should the department fund. So agile thinking is important. And I, I believe we've learned that a lot from other speakers. Sir Paolo would always mention that you know you get to uh, get to be prepared when the opportunity comes, um, like for this for green green green, or maybe other who are other other um, landscape architects who are currently connected with um, government right now, uh, working under uh, maybe city engineering or uh, departments related to projects. When the, when the mayor or the leader decides to, oh, let's do this project, then you'll produce the design in maybe three days. No? So you need to be prepared for that. You need to have that agile thinking. And uh, we've mentioned a lot of this a while ago, um, the collab collaboration part. Uh, we've mentioned about stakeholders, consultation. So um, there's a lot of these activities in government and civil society projects and, of course, urban development projects. Um, and uh, when we say stakeholder consultation, we're working with people who, uh, have, who don't have the same background as planners, designers have, but we need to listen to them, you know. And it's also like a mandate. By the by, by by the government to have this consultative process, right? So yeah. have that patience to hear and uh, um, listen to their input. Uh, sometimes it gets to uh, it 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 uh, it helps to start by having a lecture about what the project is, so that you'll have a co common understanding before the consultation takes in. Uh, but sometimes not. And or sometimes you have that first step, but then uh, you still have think differently about the project because there are projects like uh, I mean there are people who still don't have that full grasp of the importance of open spaces, and we know that. And hopefully this pandemic yeah. have have helped yeah. in realizing that, right? So you'll you'll need that co collaboration skills with um, various types of people. Um, you have the consultative people and the unconsultative people, but both have to hear them out, right? And see how you can place those inputs in your in your design or in your project. And um, lastly, maybe, I don't know, but um, this helped me in working with government projects. You'll have this service oriented mindset because you uh, i mentioned a while ago your task goes beyond right um and one way to um i, I mean when you're working with government projects or when, when you're working with the government you're already serving the country uh, but the task goes beyond like you need to teach you need to really um take time to um uh 
talk with a lot of people, no? So, um, knowing that this is a service will help, help to um, be uh, patient and uh, persevere in the project that we're work you're working on, with, especially in government. So service mindset, no? Yeah. Collaboration, patience, and agile thinking. How about you, Julia? I think picking up on what Faith said, you know, you know, unfortunately, there's not enough demand. Even though there's a more awareness, I think every year with every project and every you know mm -hmm. situation, I think there's a more awareness about the importance of good design. But I don't think that sometimes there's not enough pr like projects out there to like actually you know um, to, to to absorb all of the uh, the need. And so I think. I think, you know, as in any field, you have to kind of decide for yourself where you want to be in the conversation. I think that's kind of number one. Um, you know, maybe you're someone who wants to help build that awareness. Um, maybe you're someone who, like, you really just want to be the designer. You really just want to, you know, not be dealing with people. And you, you find that it works for your personality, for your lifestyle, for your responsibilities to have, like, you know, a stable job and be able to um, work on certain projects that you know the timelines of and that are going to push through and um, aren't going to be difficult. I mean, I think all of those things are are right. And I think you just need to um, kind of understand yourself because it is a very difficult sort of, it can be a very difficult road to go down. Um, there's a lot of frustrations. And a lot of times um, you might have an idea of how you want something to be. And there's a lot of compromises that have to be made. Um, you might be frustrated about how things are implemented. Your designs might not even, you know, even like what your client has paid you to do might come out differently in the end. Um, so I think, um, you know, for me personally, like I've grown through different phases of my life being passionate about the same things and my perspective and my approach has also changed um so i think you know kind of I, I guess it's a little bit more philosophical but like being very much in touch with yourself always being authentic to who you are and and being able to find work to support yourself can be a very uh difficult balancing act um but it's something to always be aware of you know like i thought i had made it when I got into MMDA, I was like, I'm going to be able to change everything. Like now I'm on the inside, you know, like this is going to be amazing. And like, honestly, I was, I was pretty miserable <laughs> most of the time. Um, I felt like I had a stronger voice when I was an advocate from the outside, mm -hmm. you know, when I can kind of be my own person, I was really like struggling with like whether or not in my mind, you know, of being a leader, if that was the kind of leadership position that I was, you know, well suited for, um, you know, I had, there was a very difficult um, personal struggle in a lot of ways. Um, and I think, you know, at the same time, like working at the World Bank, there was things that were great. There were also things that were, you know, like our report's going to sit here and like, who's going to move it forward? Um, the government still has to adopt it. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, and then you're an advocate and you're like, well, but I don't know if anyone's listening to me or I don't know if, you know, I, I want to be part of, of getting things done. Um, so I've, I've gone through a lot of those different experiences. And I think you have to really just listen to yourself and, um, you know, try to find what angle works for you. Some people also want to be, you know, like bridge builders. Some people want to be the catalyst that, you know, move something forward by, you know, burning the bridge down. Um, you know, I've had friends who also are on different sides of how they want to approach bringing attention to certain issues. Mm -hmm. So I really think that you need to um, understand what kind of, this is like so philosophical, but like understand what kind of no, life no. you want to live, where you see yourself in, in being part of a movement and, and what it, because of what it means to you. And I think at the end of the day, it has to come from a very authentic, from a very authentic place mm -hmm. so that like you can really get through the hardships that are going to inevitably be there as you try to grow in your field, gain recognition, survive, support yourself, and also um, become, you know, the the professional that you want to be. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's it all boils down to to yourself, I guess. Um, it the work would be easier if you know where you're at or where you're. I mean, it, you mentioned it's very ph philosophical, but um, in a lot of aspects, it's difficult to do something wherein you don't know if you're going to be happy with it or, you know, like, especially dealing with a lot of, um, with these advocacies, dealing with the government, 
policies and all that. It's 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 hard. It's a difficult um, environment. So if you don't know where you want to be and if you don't know um, what your purpose is in that conversation, it would be a difficult um, route probably for you to take. You know? And like, you know, leadership and and different these kind of concepts take a lot of different forms, you know, like the way that you're able to change the world and change your corner of the world um, can be, you know, can mean a lot of different things. So um, yeah. I think it really boils down to like what you want to add and, and what you want to give. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and yeah. do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. just to add, <laughs> just do it. Like for example, yeah. uh, and just do it. Yeah, that's a great. That's yeah. a great. That's that's totally right, Faith. I completely agree. Like, um, mm-hmm. like the projects that Julia had worked on are pioneering projects. Uh, I we've mentioned already the Green 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 pro- program and others yeah. that Julia have worked on, and so at least someone did already in that generation. Sure. And your generation, in yeah. us will do some. Maybe continue we that. Will. <laughs> Right? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, yeah. Right now, I think the Green Green program is, I'm not sure, but maybe a lot of the budget right now are for the Bayanihan Law. No, mm-hmm. um, there there has some uh, there there are reallocations that have happened already since the pandemic started, but eventually, if not Julia, if not us, then the next people who have seen that program will take on, will continue or next leaders, um, et cetera, and et cetera. Or someone working in the DNR will take on that. And at least we have something to look at as an example. I mean, especially the the, the, the gener- your generation and the, the generation next to you. That yeah. uh, this, is, this has been done already, so we can do it again. We can improve on it. Because for us, for, for with, with Julia and I, we had so many things to that we wish uh, to do for the next, the second year of, of funding, sure. yeah. right, uh, Julia? Yeah. And to improve yeah, everything. Uh, and, and also to, to um, uh, working the government is, you know, um, you, need to, you need to have a bigger picture, but you also need to maximize what you have, like the influence or the, the, um, the, the, where, are, where you are placed uh, yeah. at. Um, uh, and uh, with 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 working with DBM, I think we have uh, consulted with CCC, Climate Change Commission, and other sectors, uh, other departments and agencies in the government. So they have that they 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 took on the concept of this program, and hopefully, um, if not in this type of funding program, um, open spaces or. Uh, Public open spaces will 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 uh, take on with other department or agencies of the government. I actually saw a First. bill recently, Faith, that referenced you know in the in the opening description of the bill, the justification. It actually talked about about green, 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 for instance. So like, you know, at first it felt like really difficult because a lot of um, the, the kind of things that we were building towards were, were not gonna be possible, um, even though the fund did continue. Um, but then you never know like later on, like how these things are gonna pop up again, what influence they're gonna have, what impact they're going to have down the road. And I, and I also agree with you, Faith, like the just do it and, and look for kind of um, like partners that you might not think about. Um, you know, I think like I love right now what's going on in the mobility movement where yeah. like the pop up bike up lanes and a lot of those groups coming together and really embracing um, like a very strong kind of uh, tactical urbanism um, and, and really, really moving a lot of the conversation uh, because of just what's being done on the ground and like working directly with their cities and doing it and, and maybe even stepping out of your landscape architecture. Um, community and and finding alliances and finding collaboration opportunities with people in other professions or other movements, Mm -hmm. um, you might find that there's actually a lot of synergy uh, that can be done uh, like across and and you might come up with, you know, that's I think something that um, that can be done also and and lead to really interesting new opportunities and new ways to look at things and unlock the potential and kind of break down barriers that need to be breaking broken down to kind of advance these these things further. So yeah, I think that would be um, you know uh, another another opportunity to think about. 
So a lot of um, a lot of at least uh, viewers now who are my friends and <laughs> who are in my generation um, might um, also find interest in what you do. Um, is there any way they can like how they can or where they can go or how they can start or get on with this? Yeah, I mean, I'm. You mean like personally? Like, I mean, I'm on. I'm on LinkedIn, on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, <laughs> I have an email address, I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, so I'm working now with uh, Agile City Partners. We have a couple of projects. Um, I'm working with Benji de la Pena. Um, he's based out of Chicago and um, a woman in Costa Rica named Andrea. And we have, uh, we're working on um, a global partnership for informal transportation, actually and some work around informal transportation and trying to bring light to like this huge sector of public transport that's being provided by all of these informal systems. Um, and then I'm also involved with uh, the Asia Foundation, um, Philippines working on mobility policies and some public space stuff. Um, I, I would also check out like, uh, like, you know, DOH is doing really interesting things too around public space and their interest in like healthy mm -hmm. communities is something that's also, you know, aside from the yeah. usual suspects like the, the DOTR, um, you know, yeah. the DPWH, uh, I, like things like, like you know, DNR, uh, DOH is, is doing some interesting stuff. Um, so there, I don't know if there's any opportunities there, but uh, I saw like, you know, they put out the active mobility playbook they're talking about um, public space and the important, of course, like post pandemic as well. That might be one yeah. place to to also look if you're interested in government work. Yeah. All right. So before before we end, um, well, Mampay said it's a diff difficult question, but I want to ask, what for you is an ideal city? <laughs> so difficult. Uh, yeah. <laughs> before we end, just one last question. <laughs> Sure. Go ahead. Um, okay, I'm gonna go first, Julia. Or sure. Yeah. Would you want? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, my my ideal city. Uh, I'm I'm a believer of John Gell. You know, uh, the uh, six for people. Actually, um, by by is that Byron mentioned a while ago. Uh, benefit the people planet and actually progress uh, for for the un the, the un agenda it's balancing people planet uh, and progress a city yeah. that's like that and to achieve that i think important is um scale so when we talk about scale we uh we want sustainability be in the community level and when we see sustainable sustainable communities uh, we talk on um, resource efficiency. So you work on with your resources first, whether land, whether the environment uh, that you are at. And then if you don't have the resource that your people need, then you collaborate with, the, uh, with another community. So that's the third one. You have that com collaborative um, uh, community aspect. And then also a city that... Uh, um, celebrates diversity. So diversity in every aspect, we've already talked about various, having a network of various open spaces. Uh, we've talked about, uh, we, we, we want various solutions so that we have a more livable, a vibrant city. So that's my ideal city. How about you, Julia? My ideal city is somewhere that, you know, you can live your truth and reach your potential in a way that you know is respectful of others and the environment um i think people come to cities to find opportunity they come to cities to be the version of themselves that they they want to be um and i and i believe that to be true anywhere in the world um so you know hopefully a city is you know a good city aids you in that pursuit uh, as opposed to like throwing down challenges in your way and making it that much more difficult to achieve. Um, so it should foster a better of a better quality of life for everybody who comes to it. Yeah. And, you know, as a baseline, you know, respecting those, those, those basic rights, but then being something more, which is that it helps you to, to build the life that you really want to live for yourself. Um, that can mean a lot of different things, but it should, you know, that's what the diversity relates to. 
you know, yeah. so um, it, it should be something that that can be that can that can be healthy and productive and and, and offer something for everyone. Nice, nice. It's not a difficult question. <laughs> it's difficult to get there, though, right? <laughs> Very. <Yeah. laughs> but at least the vision's there. There's a vision, right? <laughs> yeah. It's just getting there. Yeah. So, um, thank you, thank you, Julia. Thank you, Faith, for um being our guests tonight. Um, I'm sure our viewers caught great insights from our conversation. Um, I hope they got to learn a lot from you, um, especially um, now in the pandemic, um, a lot have been eager to be out there and to, you know, to really just spend more time um, outside and, you know, appreciating. And I, I hope, I hope these um, advocacies that you've shared would also take on and um, later on, you know, it, won't stop with with your generation and for those that are listening now i mean there's so many things that you can do to be able to you know help out and you know really be a voice of change so thank you thank you so much for 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 giving your time tonight to share these things is there anything else that you want to say or add on or no, nope. just uh, hope that anyone who wants to reach out will reach out if there's something that you need that uh, we could help with. Maybe not, maybe so. I don't know. But um, yeah, just looking forward to uh, reconnecting with all this community. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you again yeah. for sharing your evening with us. Um, yeah, so um, that's all for tonight. And I, I hope everyone had a great um, time listening and Always remember service mindset, collaboration, patience, agile thinking, and being authentic and being true to yourself. And you know, I think that's that's the whole gist of it. Um, again, thank you everyone for for coming in and tuning in tonight. And we hope to see you again soon. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so hope, hope everyone had a great time with um, Faith and Julia. Um, I really wish everyone a good night and a happy Monday. Um, so if if there are any questions, feel free to reach any, any of them or even us and um, we'll get back to you. So thank you and um, I hope to see you in the next episode of Palacuento. Bye.